Taiwan, a country I'm proud to say I'm from. In my career as a media entrepreneur, I've spoken to movers and shakers here who make global headlines. But what I'm most excited about are the up and coming forces of my generation. They're young, they're creative, they dare to defy the status quo. Follow me as I meet emerging leaders of Taiwan who lift us, who inspire us, who are changing the world, starting in Taiwan. This is Game Changers with Emily Waiwu. At the time of this episode's release, it would have been more than one year since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. As of taping today, the war on Ukraine continues, but so does Ukraine's fight for the survival of their country. For Ukrainians living outside of their country, their battles take place online. It's a fight for their narrative of their country. Our guest today, Alexander Shin, he's one of the 250 Ukrainians living in Taiwan. He's been here even before the invasion on February 24th, 2022. There's no Ukrainian embassy in Taiwan, not a trade office. Oleg and his colleagues, they created something called the Ukrainian Voices. It's a citizen diplomacy platform. They're also a community for Ukrainians in Taiwan. It's their way of sharing the story of Ukraine and explain to Mandarin readers what's happening. Here's your game changer today. He's projecting the voice for Ukrainians at this critical time for his country. Oleg, so good to have you today. Uh, thank you for having me here. Alexander Shun, um, you are fourth generation Soviet Korean. You grew up in a small town in southern Ukraine. How's everybody at home? Uh, well, everyone had to leave uh, our town, obviously. There's very few people who stayed. And my family also, they evacuated to South Korea several months ago. You were here on February 24th, mm -hmm. 2022. Um, what happened that day? I mean, honestly, very few people really thought that what happened would happen, right? And I guess I was in disbelief. I, I, until the last moment, I didn't think that this was going to happen, actually. And I was just having my lunch on that day with my friends. And then someone texted me saying that the war started. And of course, my reaction was like, duh, it started in 2014. It's been going on for years, probably, you know, another missile or something. But then I, I see the news and I realize that it's full scale now and that Russia is attacking us from north, east and south. And uh, my family lives very close to those areas that were affected. So first thing I did, of course, I called my parents and it was all, you know, in disbelief. I, I couldn't really comprehend at that moment what was happening to me and to our country. So I actually woke up my parents. Uh, they were asleep and they didn't know anything yet. And I told them that it's, it started. I didn't know what started. I just knew that something had started. And yeah, um, they assured me that they're safe. But the next call during the day, they told me that it's very loud in there. They could hear missiles. They could hear uh, windows shaking. They were preparing their um, basement in case they needed to hide. Because obviously they didn't prepare it in advance because then again, so many people in Ukraine really didn't think that this was gonna happen. And yeah, and then at the end of the day, they were occupied. It was an insane day because I saw news and I couldn't believe that this was going to happen, that I, could, I would see names of nearby towns on the news, you know, towns that, I mean, there's nothing ever happens there. And suddenly they are on the news and there are people dying. This was surreal. Um, yeah, then again, I couldn't really grasp the, I didn't have that feeling of reality at that time. It actually took me months to realize that this is happening. That was around the time when my parents realized that that part of Ukraine is not going to be the same anymore. It's going to be a lot of danger. And they started preparing for evacuation, like many other people. Around 50% of our town just left. So after the invasion, you and your colleagues, several of you started the Ukrainian Voices it's on Facebook, it's on Instagram, it's on Twitter. Why was this important? This was very improvised, you know. Um, 
because none of us were trained in this, none of us knew how to do this kind of things. Everything took learning. The only thing that we had is basically our perspective, our voice. That's what Ukrainians around the world started doing very actively on February 24th. Especially those who, you know, weren't fighting physically or weren't volunteering with humanitarian aid on site. Especially Ukrainians living abroad. It's the minimum that we could do was to try to speak louder. And given that platforms are very limited for Ukrainians because uh, we don't have an embassy, we don't have any cultural representation, a representative office. The community was very disconnected and decentralized, so nothing that could, you know, be representative of the Ukrainian voice. Mm -hmm. That's why we decided to create these platforms on Facebook and this Instagram and Twitter. Mm -hmm. We didn't even come up with a better name, it's just called Ukrainian Voices, and that's what it is. Uh, it's the voices of Ukrainian people. If it's not us who provide that context, then it's going to be someone else, right? It could as well be Russia, because they have very powerful propaganda channels. There's many of you in different places of the world countering this other narrative. Um, gives a sense of what, what that scale looks like. The Ukrainians have shown impressive coherence, I think, um, after February 24th, especially. And these days, I feel like no Ukrainian in the world is left alone to do what they want to do. There's always someone who's going to come and join you. Uh, we have one goal that is more clear for us now than it used to be, you know, after 2014 invasion. So all this kind of efforts, it's, it's always complemented by someone else, not necessarily here in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So our team is, of course, Ukrainians living in Taiwan. It's also Taiwanese volunteers who help translate our content because we're mostly, um, we mostly write in English and then they help us localize the content. And then we co co collaborate with uh, Ukrainians living in Korea, in Japan, in other countries in Europe, in, in the States and we exchange our opinions and perspectives about how to better, you know, do what we are doing. Mm. For this project, because we don't have any budget, we don't run, you know, on sponsorship. Completely volunteer-based. Yes, it's completely volunteer-based. Everything. Our logo was designed by a Ukrainian living in Germany. Our content is written, written by Ukrainians living all around the world. And yeah, the, the, the main production center is here in Taiwan. So it sounds like there's a movement um, forming for Ukrainian diaspora. Mm. Um, how quickly was this formed? Uh, very early on, Ukrainians living in different other countries, they started, well, first of all, they started talking to each other, which didn't always happen. And then, of course, when there's a resource shortage, there's shortage of expertise, people started learning from each other. Some time ago, we've become a part of uh, the so-called Volia Hub, which is a global, kind of like an umbrella, kind of a hub uh, organization that provides expertise and knowledge to platforms similar to ours, that provides expertise and knowledge to platforms similar to ours. It's composed of storytellers, content creators, journalists, researchers, people who can really uh, give us some perspective on um, how to better do our job, how to better communicate. And their focus is uh, Russian colonialism, mm -hmm. which is something that people haven't discussed for a long time. Even Ukrainians themselves, they don't like to view Ukraine as a colony, but Discussions on Russian colonialism actually provide a very useful lens on what is happening and what was happening in Ukraine for the past several centuries. Countering narratives um, from a giant neighbor next door is something that Taiwan knows a little bit about. For you, for Ukrainians in Taiwan, there's about 250 of you with residencies in Taiwan. Your group, Ukrainian Voices, in addition to providing information, raising awareness, um, to Taiwanese um, and in Mandarin to the world. Um, this is, you've also created a community 
for Ukrainians in Taiwan. When people read something from the Ukrainian Voices platforms, they have similar response. They say that they do feel like we're speaking a, a story that is similar to Taiwan too. And some of those are, for example, when we discuss the history of uh, Ukrainian language being oppressed, a situation that also happened in Taiwan historically. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we talk about minority languages, when we talk about indigenous languages, when uh, we talk about human rights, when we talk about identity or reclaiming narratives, those things I think are very similar between our countries. And because it is similar, many people in Taiwan can actually relate and understand better what we're trying so hard to say. Things like histories of oppression, it's something that wasn't discussed in the context of Ukraine, because for the past 300 years, Russia controlled global narratives about Ukraine. We didn't have our own voice. We didn't have uh, our own platforms. Everyone in the world learned about Ukraine through this Russian lens, mm -hmm. which is very colonial, um, very harmful to Ukraine mm -hmm. to this day. What do you say when you meet a Russian person who is for the invasion? I've never met one in person, at least not the open, openly for invasion one. Um, I want to believe that there's just not many Russians supporting Putin in Taiwan. There's a lot of them in digital space, of course. People think that this is a new war that started in February. And then Ukrainians be like, no, it started in 2014. But no, it started 300 years ago or so, when Ukraine first started fighting for its existence, for the language, for the whole, the very right to say that Ukrainians are Ukrainians, not little Russians, not you know a subgroup of Russians. And uh, this is something that we are trying to communicate with people, that you see the news about Ukraine all the time. Ukraine is not just news, it's histories and it's stories and it's voices. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this through our perspective, you will see that Ukraine is a country of survivors basically. And that's not only about ethnic Ukrainians themselves who survived genocides and deportations. It's also about many ethnic minorities like mine, for example, Koreans in Ukraine mm -hmm. and in the former Soviet countries mm -hmm. are also survivors of a Russian-led Soviet empire mm -hmm. of deportations and assimilations. And that is something that really binds us in Ukraine these days, that we have to speak our truths and we have to keep talking about this to people outside Ukraine, because otherwise they wouldn't understand why what happening is happening. Yeah. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll keep talking to Oleg about his family history. Welcome back to the show. I'm Emily Wai Wu, and this is where I talk to really interesting and young people doing important things in Taiwan. Today, we've been talking to Alexander Shin, co-founder of Ukrainian Voices, who's providing a narrative for Ukrainians. You know a bit about the experience of being displaced. You are a fourth generation Soviet Korean. You grew up in Ukraine. Your parents are from Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Uh, your great grandparents were part of what's known as the deportation of Koreans of 1937, when 170,000 Koreans living in the Soviet Far East near Korea were deported by Stalin to Central Asia. Tell us about this history. Well, it's something that wasn't discussed in our family for a very long time. And I know why, obviously our grandparents, our parents were conditioned not to talk about this. Mm. Um, because it's part of the Soviet Union, right? You don't question the authorities, even if they killed half of your family. And this did happen to my grandpa and his mom. They were deported from uh, uh, Far East Russia to Central Asia. Mm -hmm. That's where my parents were born. That's where I was born. Uh, thousands of other Koreans. It's kind of like a, a separate group on its own. Uh, we call ourselves Koryo Saram, 
which means the people of Koryo, people of Korea. But for quite a long time, I feel like the history of deportation and before deportation wasn't really discussed. So it did feel like there was something missing. Mm -hmm. And I did feel like the, the Korea that we growing up imagined as our motherland does not exist anymore because then soon after Korea split and now there's a, a totally different situation. So that's why in the 90s when many Koreans they started moving somewhere uh, searching for better lives, many moved to Ukraine. It's thousands of people actually. Mm. And my family was uh, one of those people moving. It happened around the time when Ukraine's indigenous people, Crimean Tatars, also started returning from exile. Because like many other ethnic groups, they were deported to Central Asia, mm -hmm. where we all met basically. Uh, but then they started going back to Crimea after Ukraine's independence. So many Koreans decided to go there too. That's how uh, quite a huge Korean community formed in Ukraine. At some point, it was about 40 to 50,000 people. Given that context, what does the idea of statehood or culture or language mean to you? Growing up, definitely there was a feeling of nationalism and patriotism, but it wasn't associated with Ukraine as much as with imagined Korea. And by saying imagined is that, I mean that obviously neither me nor my parents nor my grandparents had ever visited Korea before. But we, we grew up, both of our generations basically, we grew up knowing that there's a, a great country of Korea that we should aspire to. Someday it will be unified and we'll be a part of it. Being a proud Ukrainian wasn't an option because even Ukrainians weren't proud most of the time. And that's the result of uh, Russia's policies. When they instilled and when they conditioned people to just live knowing that there can never be as great a people as Russians themselves. When I was growing up, we spoke a mix of Ukrainian and Russian, which is the result of Russification in Southern Ukraine. And it was a common sense that Ukrainian language was a language of villagers, language of uneducated people, and that everything Russian is great. Are you proud to be Ukrainian? I am proud to be Ukrainian. Uh, I am proud of being a part of the global Ukrainian movement also. A movement of people who at this time decided not to remain inactive mm -hmm. or remain silent. Because this is existential pretty much. And it's not just about Ukrainians as an ethnic group. It's about Ukraine as a nation. And Ukrainians are a political nation. Unlike what Russians are trying to say to the world, that Ukraine is a nation of, you know, little Russians. No, it's a nation of people who believe that they're Ukrainian. They might not have been born Ukrainian, but they know that they are Ukrainian right now. They identify with this nation and they see that what's happening right now is wrong. And yes, I'm pretty much proud of being um, a part of that Ukrainian movement right now. Sit here with you, listening to you tell your stories. Um, you, you have a great sense of hope, actually. Mm -hmm. um, where do you get this hope from? What, what keeps you hopeful? Many things. Uh, first of all, our army, our armed mm -hmm. forces who showed us miracle. Um, I think not many Ukrainians thought that Ukrainians would be able to defend their country with, with this much courage and dedication. That's where our armed forces proved us wrong. And Ukraine's defense in general, not just soldiers, but also everyone who's involved, thousands of Ukrainian volunteers who are collecting and donating all the time. The community is giving me strength and hope, of course, and um, solidarity. That's, I think, one of the main things that gives hope to most Ukrainians. And especially here in Taiwan, we have a lot of it. We have a lot of understanding from the Taiwanese people, from people uh, living in Taiwan in general. 
Solidarity comes with not just understanding, but also the willingness to listen. I think I would speak for every Ukrainian here. In the times like this, you really need someone to be there for you and to say, we are on your side. We understand what you're going through. And yeah, people like you, Emily, um, who reach out, offer platforms for us to speak, offer audience who would listen and understand. That is really important and it's very empowering. It gives us great hope that Ukraine won't just achieve peace, will achieve victory. And for us, it means freedom in all our territories, in every Ukrainian town and for all Ukrainian people. You offer me hope, actually, um, that solidarity is that in times of crisis, we can stand together yes. and we each have a role to do something um, that's impactful, that's meaningful, then we can, we can change something and change that narrative. And, and, and that is extremely powerful. It's very important, yes. I mm. hope the war never comes to Taiwan. Mm. But if something is to happen, I really hope that Taiwanese people will be ready to, to become one. Because apart, it's so much harder to achieve change. Before we let you go, any last words you want people to know about Ukraine? The greatest thing about Ukraine is its people. I want everyone to keep listening to the Ukrainian people because no one but Ukrainian people can talk about Ukraine, can define Ukraine. And we try to do it in our own words and we're very grateful that people choose to listen to Ukrainian voices and not someone else's voices when it comes to Ukraine. Thank you for coming on the show today and talking to us about your experience. Oleg Shin, co-founder of Ukrainian Voices, bringing awareness and taking back the narrative on Ukraine. This episode goes out to everybody in the world who is displaced, exiled, and waiting to find their way home. I'm very happy to hear about your family being safe today, and I hope all of you can return soon to home one day. I hope so too. Thank you so much. My name's Emily Wairu, and this is Election. Please do look up Ukrainian voices, and wherever you are in the world, get involved with the Ukrainian community where you are. As always, you've been watching Taiwan Plus. Um, look us up on all social media networks, follow and subscribe. And we'll see you next time.